we saw last time how the plasma membrane creates a boundary. But I think we can also understand that it can't be a boundary in which nothing can pass. Because for cells to live, materials have to move in and materials have to move out. So this whole idea of transport and, and how cells do this can really be wrapped up into these two larger categories of passive versus active transport. Now notice under passive transport we have some distinctions and under active transport we have some distinctions and we'll get to those. But when you hear the words passive and active, what do you think is a principal concept that's going to distinguish passive from active? What's different? Energy. And we already know from unit one, for cells, what is their energy currency? ATP. So, passive transport, does it require ATP? No. Active transport, does it require ATP? All right. So that's the big distinction. You need to hang on to that distinction because when we get to one of the passive transport systems, proteins are going to be moving. Proteins are going to be helping transport materials. But there's no energy that's going to be expended. So that's going to be a place where you might get confused and you might assume since the protein's moving and changing, shape energy's being used. But remember, it's going to be under passive transport and all of those under passive transport do not require energy. I'm spending a little bit of time on that because in 15 years I've seen that happen over and over and over to students. The only time we're going to use energy is when we have that term in the type of transport we use. Make sense? All right, that's a good foundation to jump off to. So we're just going to review diffusion as os osmosis since we, by and large, covered that in the first unit in our discussion of water and its importance to cells. But again, no energy needed. And for diffusion, we're going to add something in front. You remember in algebra? When you saw a variable A or B, what was always assumed to be in front of that? One. You didn't have to write it because you, it was just assumed you understood that one was there. When you see diffusion, even though it's not written, it is assumed you understand that the word simple is in front of that. Simple diffusion. Molecules move, and when we say diffusion, what direction are we talking about? Downhill, high concentration to low concentration with no energy required and nothing else helping it. That's simple diffusion. And so with our example that we see at the top, we have a membrane that's separating these two solutions. But notice, this membrane is permeable to the solute but in this particular illustration, the membrane is not permeable to water. So the solute can pass back and forth, but water can't. So when you see our solute molecules that are high concentration in A, low concentration in B, when you, when you see those solutes moving across the membrane to balance out the concentration on both sides, what type of transport did you just witness? Solutes move from high to low. What is that? Diffusion. That is diffusion. So with diffusion, we're talking about the movement of solutes. Somebody give me an example of a solute. Salt. What's another one? Sugar. When you get to your circulatory system, you're going to see that a ton of protein that's in the plasma of your blood is primarily only there to function as solute. Your liver is going to spend a lot of energy making a protein called albumin that's in your plasma. It's primarily only there to act as a solute to maintain the water concentration of your blood. So, it can be protein. 
It can be salt. It can be sugars. It can be a number of different things, but diffusion refers to the movement of solutes. Now, osmosis, that's a, a unique term, and osmosis only applies to what compound? Water. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now, it's sort of a different setup because, see, we've got the same situation here. A has the higher number of solutes. B has the lower number of solutes. And our membrane is not permeable to those solutes, so we say it's semi-permeable, but water can move across that membrane. Now, before we see what's going to happen, how can you compare solution A and solution B. Solution A would be considered what type of solution relative to B? Say it. Hypertonic. Hypertonic. Hyper is a prefix meaning more. And what are we seeing more of? Solute. Uh, again, I I'm keep going back because there seems to still be confusion. Hypertonic, isotonic, hypotonic. It's referring to the solute concentration of one solution or one compartment compared to the next. So if the solutes can't move but water can, the water molecules move from B across the membrane to the side of A. Now you see how for diffusion, <coughs> excuse me, when the solutes can move, they're trying to equal out the concentration on both sides, right? But here, the solutes can't move but the water can. What, do you, what can you see about the concentration? Doesn't that look about the same? So even with osmosis, you're trying to attain the most disorganized state possible. That's that whole entropy idea that we mentioned early in Unit 1. But that's why the water moves across the membrane to try to become as disorganized with the solutes as possible. And so the solutes in A, the hypertonic solution, has an attractive pressure for water. And that attractive pressure is referred to as osmotic pressure. All right? So when we look at simple diffusion, no energy required, movement across a semi-permeable membrane, high concentration to low, Remember, the molecules that are principally going to do that are small. And certainly CO2 and oxygen and O2, those are small. Non-polar molecules, again, are hydrophobic molecules. They are going to move across this membrane fairly readily. And so we see water can move in and out fairly easily. Even though it is polar, water is one of these special molecules that can do this. There's CO2, there's oxygen. But notice we have other materials being transported that are being transported through the use of proteins. So don't think that just because molecules aren't on our list of molecules that can simply diffuse in, that other molecules aren't going to get in and out of the cell. Because think of glucose. Glucose has to get into the cell. What do we need glucose for? Energy. Without energy, we're not going to be here. So now I want to shift gears just a bit. Anytime you hear the word diffusion, whether it's a standalone or someone actually spells out simple diffusion, or you put this term facilitated in front of diffusion, no energy is being used. Materials are moving from high concentration to low concentration. But now the distinction between simple diffusion and facilitated is that facilitated diffusion uses plasma membrane proteins to get across. So think of these plasma membrane proteins like a tunnel, a revolving door, um, any sort of electronic door that may swing open for you to gain access to a building or get out of a building. So these proteins make it possible 
for other materials to be transported in and out of the membrane. Now, we have two types. We have the carrier protein. The carrier protein is going to be like that revolving door. It's actually going to interact with the molecules to be transported, and it's going to change shape to move those molecules through the protein and release it to the opposite compartment. Versus what we consider a channel protein, a channel protein is going to be more like a tunnel. But don't get me wrong, this tunnel isn't going to allow anything and everything to pass. Both the carriers and the channels are going to be selective. And most are going to transport only a very unique molecule and not everything. That's in a general sense. We do have some that may in fact transport two molecules. They may transport two molecules in the same direction, or they may transport two molecules in opposite directions. So there's some distinction, but by and large, most are going to transport one and one in one direction only. So again, I think I've already mentioned when we get to our nervous system, we're going to see two channel proteins that are essential for the neuron being able to signal. One is a sodium channel, and one is a potassium channel. Now, does, does anyone remember from unit one when we talk about sodium and potassium? What was the word I wanted you to remember about sodium and potassium? Opposite. They're opposite. So in addition to the, these channels and neurons transporting different ions, they're going to allow the diffusion of those ions in opposite directions. And what dictates that movement is the concentration gradient of those ions. So once again, here we have a, a protein. This is called an aquaporin. That's an easy one. I think we've talked about it. What do you think an aquaporin allows to be transported? Water. Water. That's going to be important in the kidneys. Your kidneys are going to respond to a hormone produced by the pituitary gland that's going to allow for more or fewer aquaporins to be present in the tubules of your kidneys. More aquaporins, the less urine you produce. The fewer aquaporins, the more urine you produce. So that's going to be a response to dehydration. We also have these transporters. Here's one that I talk about where we've got bicarbonate going out and chloride coming in. So this is going to transport two molecules in opposite directions. Here we've got a molecule that's going to allow glucose to come in. It's a glucose transporter. So, so do you see the distinction between simple and facilitated? Neither requires energy. Simple diffusion, what does simple diffusion require? That's kind of a tricky question. What does simple diffusion require? It requires the, the stuff to transport, certainly. The only thing simple diffusion requires is a gradient. Other than a gradient, it doesn't need anything else to help. But facilitated diffusion, what does facilitated diffusion need that simple diffusion doesn't? A protein transporter, either a carrier or a channel. So now when we look at our protein transporters, as I've mentioned, the directionality and the number of molecules that can be transported, we can characterize them by these three terms. Uniport's the easiest. One molecule to be transported in one direction. That's it. It's like a unicycle. You got one wheel, and that's it. Have you seen, has the unicycle guy been riding around campus yet? Yeah, every semester. Now, the next two are transporters that transport two molecules, two different molecules, two different compounds. The sim porter, sim sounds a lot like same, and so sim port moves two molecules in the same direction. And I think you can lock in the 
figure out what anti, anti meaning opposite or against, transport of two molecules in opposite directions. Again, these are going to be important as we begin to look at how these work in cells, much like we see in neurons. And we're going to have one that is an antiport carrier that we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. It's going to be important uh, in neurons. It's going to be important in muscles. Uh, it's important pretty much throughout your body. So it's important to get a sense of this directionality. So as we look at facilitated diffusion, here we have, what, what might you consider this transporter to be called? Okay, what, okay, I've heard a lot of different words and that's great, that's great, because that was a very open-ended question, wasn't it? What, what could you call that transporter? So, I heard someone say symport. It's a symporter. Why is it a symporter? One in one direction. I heard, uh, now is this, what direction is the material moving? High concentration to low concentration. So you know it's diffusion, it's allowing diffusion. And since it's going through the membrane and this purple, I'll go ahead and tip you off, that's a protein. What's another way you could describe that? Facilitated diffusion. Now what about this guy over here? How would you characterize this one? The, pro the protein's moving. So is this active transport? No. What direction are the materials moving? High concentration to low concentration. When we get to active transport, in addition to having to use energy, that's because you're having to pedal uphill against a gradient. So we're still going from high concentration to low concentration. And this was the warning that I gave you earlier. Just because you see a protein moving, changing shape, transporting, this is one of our carriers, this is still facilitated diffusion. So you look at the, the direction of the concentration gradient principally, and that will tell you if it's diffusion or active transport. So sort of ignore what's happening, whether the protein is staying static or the protein is changing shape. Not that that's irrelevant, but it, it will tend to distract you if you're not careful. So simple diffusion facilitated, passive transport, no energy required, direction of transport is high concentration to low. Active transport in almost every way is the opposite. You do require energy, and the reason you do require energy, the transport is uphill or upstream. Riding a bicycle downhill, remember, you don't have to pedal. But riding a bicycle uphill, yeah, you've got to supply the energy. So for active transport, we're going to walk through some basic steps. I like to start simple and then add complexity to it, just so we make sure that we're all on the same page. And so for our active transporter, this is going to be like a carrier. It's not going to be a, just a simple tunnel. And so our first step, and we're going to have five steps here. Our first step is whatever is going to be transported, it has to bind and interact with the carrier. It's as if the carrier molecule is already sort of set and loaded and ready to jump into action. It's just waiting for something to bind to it to set it off. It's like a mouse trap. It's already pulled back. It's just waiting for something to step on the pedal. And that transport molecule, when it binds, boom, it starts the process. Now, these carrier molecules are talented because not only can they bind and transport and release these molecules, 
But these proteins also, if you could define them in such a way, are enzymes. And the reason I say they're enzymes is because in addition to binding to the transport molecule, they bind to ATP as well. And when they bind ATP, and when they, the transporter molecule binds, it's as if you turn the key on to the car and you start the energy and you start burning the fuel. Well, ATP is rapidly converted into ADP and a phosphate, and the energy of that third bond is released, and it's that energy that's released that's going to cause that protein to step number three, change its shape. And as that protein changes its shape and it moves, that's what conformational change means, a change of shape, it's going to take this molecule that maybe was on the inside of the cell. Can this be the inside of the cell? All right. So I've got ATP in my pocket, and I'm just waiting for that transport molecule to bind. And when it binds, the ATP is converted into ADP and phosphate, the energy released so that I change shape and I move the molecule to the other side of the membrane with the energy that was released from the ATP. Now, this one we're going to divide into two steps. So D is the release of the transport molecule. So we release it. But does this protein just stay stuck in this final position? No, because step E, the fifth step, is the protein returns to its starting shape. Does it need any additional energy to reset itself? No. It needs no additional energy to reset. It's almost like an elastic band. So let's go, let's go through our steps again. Okay, we're the transport, the active transport protein. Have ATP already in my pocket. I'm waiting for the transporter to come and bind. When that molecule binds, what's the next step? Energy released. What's the next step? Change shape. What's the next step? Release the molecule to the other compartment. And then the last step? Reset and do it again. Now, when I reset, what am I going to have to have before I can transport another molecule? I got to have more ATP in my pocket. Because what's happening is the direction that I'm grabbing this molecule, that, that's the low concentration side. I'm having to take this molecule that's in low concentration and I'm having to push it to this outer compartment where there's a ton of this stuff. That's the uphill part. That's the swimming upstream part. And so if we look at our illustration, and the only thing I don't like about this one, again, this is an artist that put this together, not a scientist. Look at our concentration. We were high out here and low in here. That's the only difference that I don't like about this one. But do you see how we're binding the transport molecule? There's ATP that's causing the energy to be released, changing the shape releasing the molecule inside, and resetting. These are just very, very basic steps of how active transport works. Any, any questions about this basic active transport? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Sorry? So the low concentration for this illustration would be here and you'd have a ton of red dots already in here, okay? And I wish they had done that. And if I can ever figure out how I can edit these moving GIFs, I'm going to do that myself someday. So, because active transport, what direction? Up, uphill. Takes a lot of energy to do that. Now, we've got to make sure we understand these steps of active transport. Energy and against the gradient, moving uphill. All right, are we all on the same page? because we're about to make it more complicated. I know you like it when I do that. Because active transport isn't this simple. 
And we're going to use probably one of the most abundant transporters in your body. And this is the sodium potassium pump. When you look at all the energy you use in your body throughout the day, approximately 12% of your energy expenditure during your day is taken up by these guys because they're everywhere in your body. So they're pretty important. Anything over 10%, scientists say that's significant. So when we look at the sodium-potassium pump, we're going to define the transport that occurs from the immediate and the direct use of energy as primary active transport. And for our sodium-potassium pump, the primary active transport is going to be three sodium ions are pumped out of the cell. So when you burn your ATP, that one molecule of ATP, which sets the sodium potassium pump to start, you have already bound those three molecules of sodium on the inside, and now we push those three ions of sodium outside the cell. Now in the first unit, we talked about sodium and potassium being opposite. This is kind of a tricky question. Where is sodium in the highest concentration relative to the plasma membrane? Outside. Do you know why it's highest concentration outside? Because of the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium pump, anybody know what a sump pump is? You ever heard of a sump pump? It's this water pump in your basement or you have them in your boat. If you get water in, it pumps the water out. The sodium potassium pumps almost like a sump. If sodium leaks in, sodium potassium pumps going to pump it back out. But do you see how that's against the gradient? Because sodium is already high outside and you're going to have to use energy. But notice we put primary active transport in front of this. Much like we added the facilitated diffusion in front of diffusion. So now I want another analogy, okay? So how many of you are going out of town this weekend? Okay, and y'all raised your hands fast. Are you like running away? No. Okay, so uh, who's going to Dallas? Okay, you're going to Dallas. Okay, so you're going to hop in your car, you're going to fill it with gas, and you're going to Dallas, all right? There are a lot more people in Dallas, right? So the concentration of people in Dallas is high. Not as many people here. You know, just a few, right? No. So active transport, primary active transport, right? Okay. Who else is going to Dallas? Okay. So now, since you're already going to Dallas, would it take any more energy if she came up and said, hey, you going to Dallas? Can I ride with you? You're going to make her pay for some of the gas, but right? She was like, hey, I'll go. No, but it's not going to take any more energy for her to go. But the direct expenditure of the gasoline, it's going on your car. You are primary active transport. She would be secondary active transport. Okay? Now, let's, let's play this out differently. Okay, we're going to make you drive this time. You, if you go to Dallas... And you get to Dallas, and then all of a sudden, somebody from Nacogdoches says, Hey, are you going back to Nacogdoches Sunday? Sure. You're already going. Primary active transport. You already put the gas in the car. Is it going to take any more energy for them to ride from Dallas back? No. See, you went to Dallas, but they want to come back. Going in the same direction, what kind of transport is that? Same? Simport. Simport. Opposite direction? anti-port, but it didn't take any additional energy. So with our sodium potassium pump, it takes three sodium from inside the cell, uses energy to push those three out of the cell. Now in our generic example that we did before, what, what happens now? 
What's the, what's the protein supposed to do now? It's supposed to reset, right? The sodium potassium pump, though, it gets locked. It gets locked in this position. It's not going to need any additional energy to go back into the cell, but it's, it's locked and it says, hey, anybody else need to go in? That is going to be our secondary active transport. You don't have to use any more energy, but our sodium potassium pump gets stuck until it binds two potassium ions outside the cell. And when those two potassium ions bind, it unlocks the enzyme and it resets. And when it resets, it releases the potassium back in. <clears throat> but do you see how no more energy got used? So that's an example of primary versus secondary active transport. And in fact, it gets even more complicated than that because in the body, you can separate the functions. You can separate them into different proteins. In the intestinal cells of your body, you have sodium potassium pumps down at the bottom of the cell. Throwing out that sodium, kicking it out, creating that concentration gradient where it's high sodium out, low sodium in. But on the top part of that intestinal cell, adjacent to all that material that you ate, there's a molecule that allows sodium to bind. And when sodium binds, it allows it to diffuse into the cell because of the concentration gradient that was created by the sodium potassium pump. If that thing wasn't working, this other one wouldn't. But for this, when the sodium's allowed to come in, it can't come in by itself. Guess who it has to bring with it that you need for fuel? Glucose. Glucose. It's a sodium glucose symporter. How is the glucose getting to come in? Because the sodium gets, have you ever got into somewhere because you were with a friend and they had, they knew somebody and, well, that's, that's this symporter. But the only way glucose was able to follow sodium in was because of the gradient that was created by the sodium potassium pump somewhere else in the cell. That glucose symporter would be another example of secondary active transport because glucose being transported out to in is going against the gradient because you got more glucose inside the cell than out. So this distinction between primary and secondary doesn't just apply within the same sodium potassium pump, the same protein. It can be distinguished across the entire cell. So here's our sodium potassium pump just in a static illustration. Uh, where are we going to start? So, three sodium ions here. You see how the three are bound? The little purple pearls on the inside you use energy. Changes its shape. The three sodium gets spit out. It gets stuck in this position until two potassium bind. And then it resets to its original position. And when it does so, it spits the two potassium out into the cell. How many ATP were used for that whole cycle? One. Primary active transport, secondary active transport. Do you see the distinction? Primary, the direct result of the burning of ATP. Secondary, something extra happened. All right? So here's our little three sodium in, ATP, change shape, release. Now we've got to have our two potassium before we can reset and do it again. Once again, they're not showing the correct concentration gradients. This artistic person just wanted to show you the movement of the protein relative to the ions. So don't, don't get lost because these are both active transport. One's primary, one's secondary. So what is the direction? Uphill. Active transport is always uphill. So again, here's some examples. Here's our sodium glucose symporter. And again, how is this able to come in? Because sodium 
is being transported with its great sodium's diffusing. But it's this diffusive energy that was created by the sodium potassium pump that allows the glucose to come in. Here's just an example. We've got diffusion of our sodium coming in, but as it comes in, hydrogen ions are going to go out. So that's an antiporter. But again, if the movement of the sodium is created by the gradient from the energy used of sodium potassium pump, which really all sodium movement is, then that's also secondary active transport. Do you understand those concepts? If you don't understand those concepts, we need to get that concept down. The primary active transport creates the concentration gradient of sodium. High out, low in. The result after that, if sodium diffuses in, that's going to be a secondary result, and that's considered secondary active transport because you don't need any more energy. Okay? Good? All right. Now, this is, this is really kind of shifting gears. We're still talking about transport, but we're not talking necessarily about the movement of individual molecules. This is more like bulk transport. It's like if you order you know, five things from Amazon and it comes in the one big package. So what we're doing now is we're talking about the cell either bringing in a lot of material or a cell releasing a lot of material. Now, this word Exocytosis, we're going to deal with first. Cytosis refers to the cell and the movement of its membrane. And where we see the exo, that sounds a lot like what? Exit. So we start with a cell that has produced this material that the cell needs to release to the outside environment. So the cell has packaged it up into these little membrane-bound bubbles called vesicles. Many of these are going to be called transport vesicles or secretory vesicles if it's destined to be released outside the cell. So these vesicles will move to and fuse with the plasma membrane. As they fuse with the plasma membrane, do you see how the contents of that vesicle are now open to the external environment and they're released. We're going to see neurons secrete a ton of chemical signals. Your immune system cells will secrete a number of chemical signals, all done by this process of exocytosis. A lot of times people just wrap this up in this word called secretion. They're not exactly the same thing. So this is exocytosis. You can think of it like cell spitting. That was kind of gross. but Now, the opposite of exocytosis, see this is our exocytosis in this illustration. Well, if you could reverse the arrows where the cell makes a little pocket in the membrane, captures material, pinches off the membrane into a little vesicle, and that vesicle becomes a free-floating little bubble inside the cell that is endo, into the cell. Now the cell does this many, many, many di different ways and different cells do. But have you ever seen those movies of the amoeba that finds something it wants to eat and it just wraps its membrane around it until it's all inside the cell? That's endocytosis. And when a cell like an amoeba engulfs material and processes it much like your white blood cells do and the macrophages in your cell which are the vacuum cleaners of the bodies when they bring in this material it's like cell eating and they call it phagocytosis but that process is going to be very very similar to this endocytosis endo bringing in exo spitting it out <laughs> So again, this, this is another way to get material in and out of a cell. Some of the material coming in is good. Some of the material going out is bad. But these, again, are transport processes, transport mechanisms. <clears throat>